from Daily Trust News Center. This is the News Hour. On News Hour tonight, flood kills three, damages 1,453 houses in Bochi communities. Brazilian returnee excretes 92 wraps of cocaine at Abuja Airport. Parents lament rising cost of school fees. And Queen Elizabeth II's cottage arrives in Edinburgh. Hello and welcome. Six major roads have been cut off as ravaging flood killed three people, destroyed 1,400 houses and rendered many people homeless in the Zaki local government area of Bochi State. The floods, which were triggered by torrential rains, also washed away six portions of the road linking Zaki and Gamawa local governments of the state. Some victims narrate their experiences. The government should come to the aid of these people. Houses have been submerged by flood, and over six communities were also affected. I remember vividly that we helped some Fulani people whose animals were also affected by the flood. The flood killed some people and made so many people homeless. We even visited the families of those that lost their relatives as a result of the flood. We are calling on the government to help these people. Elsewhere, some parents in Adama State are considering changing of schools for their kids due to rise in school fees. They are therefore appealing to school administrators, especially private schools, to reduce school fees as due session begins. They made the appeal in an interview with Trust TV's reporter, Salis Lawal Inyola. His report. Adama State Government, through the Ministry of Education, has said Monday, September 19, as the commencement of academic activities for the first time of the 2022-2023 session. The date, which is expected to be a thing of joy as the new academic calendar begins, however, did not have that effect as many parents are faced with challenge of handling the daily needs of their children while in school, as well as the increase in school fees due to the present economic realities. They said it will not be a bad idea if school administrators consider the present economic challenges and allow parents pay school fees in installments. Even to provide necessary things to the children, we are finding it difficult, talk less of uh, uh, school fees. So we are going to find it hard, but it is a necessity for us. We have to look other means to source for the income to pay the school fees. School fees. You talk about school fees and resistance. It is a very difficult situation as long as we, the parents, are in charge of our duties of our children. Uh, I think things are very difficult. The economy was too bad. Citizens are frustrated in the country. Adamujingi, a school proprietor, says the idea was not a bad one, but schools must times run at a loss. Explained that in many occasions, students change schools to avoid paying the fees on their former schools. In Yara, in Kadogara, I can do one the baby Abaka Kori answer a Macaranta. I am Zaka when Macaranta was a Kirazi Yara Bakoi, when he would use who go much happier. Yes, of course, high fees are the reason. You find some parents changing schools for their children almost every year. But I can assure you it wasn't intentional. The situation is beyond our control. Sometimes that room granted parents to pay school fees of their children instrumentally is violated, leading to schools running at a loss. So we're left with no option rather than blocking it. Teachers who are at the receiving end said they are not finding it easy to catch up with their family needs. Equally experienced such hardship from parents, from school management, from the staff, and everybody. Counting from payment of school fees. They will have started the new session, a new term. The student needs new uniform, uh, new writing and reading materials. Everything is above 
our shoulder. We parents and everybody. You can see a situation whereby students are paying school fees. Uh, at times they pay halfway. Sometimes you can find out that they will not pay at all. You have to allow them. Some of them, when uh, there will be time that will come, they, will, they, will, they tell you they will, go, they, they will change school or they will go somewhere. Or you just stop seeing them just because uh, of the situation. So we are, not, we, are not, we are not in a good situation as far as economy of the school and ourselves is concerned. Stakeholders say a reduction of school fees will go a long way to ease the burden on parents, especially those who have more than two children or what in the schools. Silas Lawan, Trust TV News, Yola. As the Academic Students Union of Universities ASU strike continues, the federal government has been called upon to fulfill its promise to the striking workers to enable students resume the active academic activities. The call was made by former Director General of the National Orientation Agency, Idi Farouk, on our Sunday politics program. The former NOA boss added that addressing the concerns of ASU would help ensure that the education sector of the country is not totally grounded. Both sides have a problem as far as I'm concerned. One, the problem of government is that, I mean, if government makes a deal, you should keep to it. If you make a promise as government, you must keep to it. But on the side of the uh, ASU, I recall that in the last general election, you know, they called off strike so that their members can go and conduct election. Mm -hmm. Or rather, they didn't call off the strike, they suspended the strike mm -hmm. so that their members can go and collect election, conduct mm -hmm. election. Mm -hmm. As return uh, officers, uh, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't really be who's, on whose side. Who are they fighting this for? Is it for self, or is it for the overall benefit of education? And in any case, six months is too long for any right-thinking group. The SDK know that, but they also include their emolument. Mm -hmm. emolument. Mm -hmm. So, if you do the decay and you don't do the emolument, you have not satisfied their what's it called? I also agree that they should be better paid. But so should every other person be better paid. The soldier should be better paid. The police should be better paid. The journalist should be better paid. It is it's something that cuts across all strata of our now, society. Minister of Labor and Employment Chris Singigi says the federal government resolved to take the academic staff union of universities ASU to court because talks between both parties have collapsed. Ingege, in an official letter addressed to the Chief Registrar of National Industrial Court of Nigeria, Abuja, and dated September 8, asked the courts to give accelerated hearing to the case in order to bring the issue of strike to an end. The letter was titled, Forwarding of a Referral Instrument in the Trade Dispute between Federal Government, Federal Minister of Education and the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU. The minister further argued that his letter, which he tagged referral instrument, was in line with powers vested on him by Trade Dispute Resolution Mechanism and the provision of Section 17 of the Trade Dispute Act, Cap TB, laws. Operatives of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLA, have arrested a Brazilian returnee, Okuli Paulinos Mwabweze, at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja, for importing 92 wraps of cocaine, which he ingested and eventually excreted after two days under observation in the agency's facility. The 53-year-old trafficker, who was arrested on Friday, 2nd September, upon his arrival on Qatar Air Flight en route Brazil, Doha, Abuja, claimed to have left Nigeria to Mozambique in 2004 and finally relocated to Brazil in 2017, where he obtained a residence permit before deciding to import the illicit substance for $4,000 fee. We have details of some of the agency's activities in the last one week. The report. Also arrested is a 42-year-old man, Ali Yubelu, who was captured at the Malang Aminu Kano International Airport, Kano, for attempting to export a consignment of new psychoactive substance, Akuskura, to Saudi Arabia. The indigenous of Kwari, local government area of Sokoto, who lives in Gorondutse area of Kano, was arrested on Monday, 5th September, 
during the outward clearance of passengers on Ethiopian airline flight in Riyadh. At the Mutala Mohammed International Airport, Ikeja, Lagos, no fewer than 1,099,000 tablets of Tramadol, 225 milligram, have been seized through the interagency collaboration between NDLEA and Nigerian Customs. The pharmaceutical opioid packed in 50 cartons were imported from Patiscom via Addis Ababa on Ethiopian Airlines. The consignment was concealed among other non-controlled pharmaceuticals. Also, a freight agent, Aliyu Abubakar, was on Friday 9th September arrested at Narco Export, shared of the airport over attempt to export a consignment of cannabis concealed inside bottles of caro white body lotion. Meanwhile, attempts by drug cartels to export 7.805 kilograms of crystal metamphetamine to United States and Australia have been thwarted by NDLEA operative attached to some Korea companies in Lagos. The meth consignment were concealed in the linings of local fabrics, wooden statutes, printer cartridges, handle of travel bag and cassava flakes. From other parts of the country, a 25-year-old pregnant woman, Haruna Febo, was arrested in Aochi, Edo State, on Friday 9th September with 82 pinches of determine as well as various quantities of Laut, Arizona, Colorado, variants of cannabis, and codeine based on cough syrup in Gombe. 190,000 tablets of capsules of Tramadol, D5, and Exol were recovered from two drug dealers, Nasiru Abubakar, 22, and Omaru Bayero, aka Adiza, when NDLEA operatives raided their stores at the Gombe main market on Tuesday 6 September. In Kogi, a suspect, Paul Ali, 47, was arrested along Okene Abuja Highway with 1,404 bottles of codeine based on syrup weighing 190.94 kilograms and 2,040 amples of petrozuzine injection coming from Onicha to Sokoto. A follow-up operation in Sokoto also led to arrest of the receiver of the consignment on Tuesday 6 September. A raid at the cannabis plantation camp in Emuru Forest, Owo, local government area of Ondo State, has led to the arrest of Monday Onoja, 20, Daniel Kaide, 25, Obinna Okechuku, 35, where 16 bags of illicit substance weighing 179.5 kilograms were seized from them. Chairman, Chief Executive of the NDLEA, Brigadier General Muhammad Buba Marwa retired in a statement by the agency's director, media and advocacy, Femi Baba Femi, the arrest and seizures commanded the officers and men of the command in Kano, Kogi, Edo, and Gombe State Command for their resilience. He charged them and their compatriots in other commands to remain focused and vigilant in their areas of responsibility. The Lorin Zono Command of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, has arrested a 29-year-old Chinese gang deng for alleged illegal mining in Ilorin. According to a statement by the head media and publicity of the commission, Wilson Wojering, on Saturday, Deng was arrested on Friday and found to be in possession of crude materials, minerals rather, without authority. The Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps has arrested Juan Chiyokche Emmanuel for allegedly defiling his 14-year-old niece. Emmanuel, 38 years old, who hails from Nakagwe West local government area of Benue State, was arrested by the NSCDC female squad in Anagata, Abuja, at about 5.30 a.m. Friday morning and handed over to the Human Traffic Unit of the Corps for his consistent sexual assault on his niece, who was under his watch. This was contained in a statement signed by the core spokesperson, Odumoso Lushola, on Saturday. Narrating her ordeal, his niece claimed her uncle sexually assaulted her on different occasions and threatened to beat her if she spilled the truth. The accused, however, confessed to the crime and pleaded for leniency, stating it was the work of the devil. Meanwhile, the commandant in charge of Anti-Human Trafficking, Irregular Migration and Other Related Offences Unit, NSCDC, Elo Janet, vowed to put an end to the recurring sexual harassment by protecting the girl child. 
You're watching News Hour on Trust Television coming up. Skin decoration that defies modernity. Details of this story after the break. Do stay. Documenting the Nigerian story. As the 2023 elections draw near, remember, evil prospers when good men and women only wish for peace, but never take a step to make peaceful elections happen. Are you a father? Are you a mother? What are you saying to your children as elections approach? Have you warned them not to let themselves be used to cause violence? Have you explained to them what the consequences of electoral violence might be. Do your part to make peaceful elections happen. Talk to your children. Protect them from unscrupulous politicians who want to put them in harm's way while their own children are comfortable at home, within and outside the country. Let's join hands to make 2023 elections peaceful. This message is from the National Orientation Agency, NOAA. Welcome back. If you are just joining us, this is News uh, on Trust Television, our top stories. Flood kills three, damages 1,453 houses in Bochi communities. Brazilian returnee excretes 92 wraps of cocaine at Abuja Airport. Moving on, there was serious tension around the Obosi end of the second Niger Bridge on Icha, Anambra State, over persistent gunshots along the road leading to the bridge. The shootouts, which began at about 9.30 a.m. on Sunday, were between some men in military attire and a group of boys suspected to be criminals. The hoodlums invaded the road linking the yet-to-be-commissioned second Niger Bridge on two motorcycles and one tricycle, where they engaged the men on military uniform who also came with a Hilux van in gun battle. The hoodlums ran into the surrounding bushes from where they engaged the operatives in exchange of bullets. The situation had caused panic around the area as people have remained indoors. The police in the state are yet to issue a statement on the incident. Gunmen have kidnapped Chief Nenga Korobshak, the elder brother of a former Plata State governorship aspirant of the People's Democratic Party, Kefas Robshak. It was learned that the elder Robshak was abducted by gunmen who attacked his community in Kwampan, local government area of the state, on Saturday. Residents of the community who confirmed the attack on Sunday said Robshak's abductors had made contact with his family members and were demanding 100 million as ransom. The People's Democratic Party, in a statement, expressed shock over this development. A heavily pregnant woman who was abducted from Mando in Kaduna in July has been delivered of a child in captivity. The victim who went to visit her ailing mother on the day the bandit struck was abducted alongside two of her sisters. Commenting on the situation, the victim's husband, Mohammed Alabi, said his wife gave birth 
at the kidnappers camp on the 2nd of August without medical care, adding that they were being maltreated and flogged by the abductors. Recounting the family's ordeal, father of the victims, Abdul Wahab Yusuf, said the bandits broke into their Mandur home around 1.05 a.m. the day of the attack. The family is appealing to the federal and Kaduna state government, charity organizations, philanthropists and well-spirited individuals to assist the family in securing the release of their loved ones. Department of State Services, DSS, says outcome of its investigation on Tukur Mamu is mind-boggling. They also warned those making comments it's described as unguarded to stop forthwith and await court proceedings. Kaduna Bay's Islamic cleric Dr. Ahmed Gumi had accused the DSS of persecution of his media consultant Tukur Mamu. In a statement issued on Sunday, the spokesman of the service, Peter Afunaya, said the DSS should be left alone to carry out its duties. Afunaya, however, said the DSS would not make further comments on Mamu's arrest since the court would determine its course. Afunaya said the service would not be distracted with some of the skewed narratives in the media space, appealing that the service be allowed to concentrate on the investigation, the outcome of which, he said, remains mind-boggling. Moving on, residents of Sokwatu are calling for urgent government attention to tackle the menace of destitution plaguing the city. This has been compounded by the influx of internally displaced persons seeking food and shelter into the metropolis. Babangida Bala reports that some residents are saying the situation is a threat to social order, not just in the capital city, but in the state. We'll bring you this report in our subsequent bulletin. Now, a cleric at Bishop John Praise has called on Nigerians to vote for capacity as campaigns roll out ahead of the 2023 general elections. He made the call while addressing journalists in his office at the nation's capital. He urged Nigerians to vote for people with good track records and also admonished all to get their PVCs to enable them vote candidates of their choice. We must vote people of competence, we must vote for capacity, and we must vote for people that have policies that can lift this country up you know, from the down uh, to train that we have been in and uh, planting our feet on solar rock to stay. So I think we need uh, to go in that direction. Um, we're gonna have a record of having done things straight in this country and having established a lot of things. You know, we must not vote for thieves. We must not vote for people that will wreck us. We must vote for people that are strong enough to lead us as a nation. Many nations in the, country, in the world today are voting young people. So let's vote for young people. Let's vote for people that are carrying us forward. I'm not saying that the old people may not have what it takes. If they have what it takes to take this country out of the wood, fine. We want people that can handle insecurity. People who can unite this country. Because we've been so divided in the last seven years, eight years of this administration. We've been so divided. And, 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 and Nigerians have suffered. Suffered hunger. And we want, we want all that to be put to rest. River State Governor Yesen Wiki has touted the ousted national chairman of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, Uche Sekondus, who was said to have danced when the National Executive Council of the party passed a vote of confidence on Senator Yocha Ayu, the embattled PDP national chairman. Governor Wiki said decision by neck would not dissuade him and others from insisting that the prevailing structural imbalance within the party must be addressed. <laughs> The governor spoke at the 11th hour homecoming and reception organized for the campaigns from various political parties who have joined the People's Democratic Party in River State. The words of those who are the country are those who you may not be hearing their names, but are the people who do the work. So we have been plucking them back. We have been plucking them back. And all those so called big men that threaten. Let me assure you that we will all work with you. There's nothing like somebody who has been there since and somebody who has come back. Governor Wike commended the Decampees for their courage to rejoin the political family, noting that no other political party can win election in River State except the PDP. 
Speaking on behalf of the Decampees from Rivers South East Senatorial District, a former member of All Progressive Congress, APC Board of Trustees, Sam Jaja, said they had a regrettable, unsuccessful political expedition while in their former parties, but have retraced their steps to the PDP on self Valition. Jaja described Governor Wike as a compassionate, loving, and graceful leader who was created to do good for the people. I'm standing on behalf of all the campaigns from Southeast Central Districts who were sometime in APC to say that none of us were invited to come. None of us were invited to the camp on our own will and evolution. We came to you and you received us. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, party chairman, for also accepting to receive us. Because we've not been fair to you. Governor Wike said the chance of PDP winning the election is inked on the fact that the party and its administration has worked to protect the interests of the state courageously. Thank you. The World Health Organization has revealed that Nigeria currently leads on the log of African countries with monkeypox infections and infertilities. World Health Organization's Regional Director for Africa, Mashidi Somoiti, revealed this during a virtual press briefing on meningitis. As of September 8, according to the Regional Director, there are now 524 confirmed cases and 12 deaths across 11 African countries. Boiti said Nigeria tops the list of the cases recorded and is followed by the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Ghana. According to her, Nigeria recorded six of the 12 deaths, while Ghana reported four and two recorded in the Central African Republic. Checks on the CDC monkeypox global map shows that as of September night, Nigeria has 220 infections followed by the Democratic Republic of Congo with 195 cases and Ghana with 76 cases, while the global infections now stand at 57,527. Speaking on Africa's progress with meningitis group A, Moiti admitted that not a single case has been reported on the continent in the past five years, but the COVID-19 pandemic delayed vaccination campaigns targeting more than 50 million African children. She also noted that the major outbreaks caused by meningitis group C have been recorded in seven of the African sub-Saharan meningitis belt countries in the past nine years. The World Health Organization has begun the training of 31 community health workers in Yoruba State to help contain the current outbreak of cholera in the state. The coordinator of World Health Organization Yoruba State Field Office, Nuhubaro Ningi, disclosed this to journalists in Damaturu at the opening ceremony of the training in Damaturu. The trainees will serve as ambassadors who will in turn educate the local people on the current outbreak of the cholera disease. The World Health Organization coordinator also noted that logistics will be made available for the trainees to get the every household in the affected communities to give the right information on the prevention, exposure and the risk of how these diseases are transmitted. This is expected to institute early warning systems and preventive measures for other diseases like monkeypox, COVID-19, measles, etc. They empower the uh, community uh, stakeholders so that they are able to uh, in, make a, an informed decision on the prevention of uh, outbreaks. Now that we are already experiencing cholera and a threat to other outbreaks uh, in Yobe State. In fact, that is why they are brought to this place for training. Uh, WHO is actually supporting this training and uh, uh, provisions will be made to them for the uh, logistic, uh, for their movements to, to reach uh, all the locations in fact, up to the households, so that they will get to the uh, to the uh, caregivers and all. Former Emir of Kano, Sunusilam Idosunusi, is now the president of the Fulani Pan African Organization, Tebitil Polako International. The former Emir took over the reins from Ahmad Diallo during an extraordinary General Assembly meeting in Abuja. 
is expected to address problems facing the Fulani societies ranging from insecurity, agriculture and education. Ghazi Yakubu was there. Fulako International is an association composed of national chapters in 24 African countries aiming to develop and preserve the Fulbe culture. The Extraordinary General Assembly meeting is echoing the unique culture of the Fulani people as the organization elect a new leader. The Fulanis is a peaceful people and we want all leaders around the world to support the peace and we want Fulanis to be protected around the globe because they are peaceful people, they are business people, they are very, very contributor around the world today. If you see the Fulanis anywhere around the world today, they are business people, they are professor, they are very good contributor around the world. Today. The new elected leader has his hand full as he is now saddled with the responsibility of tackling the challenges faced by Fulani society in West Africa. I cannot say more because he's the new president to have to define, but the vision is to uh, live together with all other tribes around the world, you know, uh, to, to, to reduce the conflict between uh, other tribes and to ameliorate our life around the world. And you know, as uh, Fulani, we have uh, many, many problems with agriculture people, and we have to manage everything. We have to make sure our young people get a good education for our future for tomorrow. The man, if we try to talk about him, I, I believe we can uh, spend the whole day here today because we heard about him even if you check his background. He, he won the best banking in the world, the whole world. So the, the Fulani is blessed to have him as a leader today. With his wealth of experience, it is expected that he will be able to safely guide effort to circumnavigate the many issues that concern the Fulani. Gaza Yakubu, Trust TV News, Abuja. The federal government has rolled out the Government Enterprise and Endow Empowerment Program 2.0 to assist the poor and vulnerable people in Abia. The Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, Sadia Umar Farouk, launched the national phase of the program in Omahia. The minister, who was represented by the Director of Special Needs, Nkechi Umwoke, said it was a program designed by President Mohamed Buhari's administration for vulnerable and low-income Nigerians. According to her, the program is meant for those who are involved in some sort of commercial activities but have never had the opportunity to access loans, adding that successful beneficiaries of the JEEP program will start receiving credit alert from Access Bank immediately after the inauguration on Saturday. The United Nations has commended the federal government's progressive efforts towards combating poverty, security concerns, economic crisis, and gender-based inequalities faced by older persons in the country. A UN independent expert on the enjoyment of all human rights by older persons, Claudia Mala, made the commendation at the debriefing meeting with top government officials on preliminary findings and recommendations after a 12 day visit to the country. Mala, who said the commendation stems from Nigeria's adoption of the National Senior Citizens Centre Act and the establishment of a dedicated centre at federal government level to ensure that the human rights of older persons are mainstreamed in all programs and activities, urged the federal government to ensure that such programs are implemented. Director General of the National Senior Citizen Centre, M.M. Omokaro, noted that the debriefing by the UN independent expert on the enjoyment of all human rights by older persons is key towards boosting Nigeria's Global Age Watch Index, among other positive expectations for Nigeria. During her mission in Nigeria, the expert held cluster meetings with relevant MDAs with the full participation of the National Senior Citizen Center being the focal agency on aging and older persons. The legal and the policy framework is quite good, but what I see what is still a little bit missing are the budget lines. So if the government increase the budget to implement the different issues on the national and on the local level, 
yes, this can work. It might take a little bit longer. They already have a kind of structure. But what I always say, without prioritizing all the persons and giving them a real focus in their policies, it will not work. So it is also a question of political will to implement the legal basis and the action plans fully. For the past 12 days, the United Nations independent experts on the enjoyment of all human rights of older persons has been in Nigeria on her special procedure, which is a scoping mission. Firstly, to access the efforts of Nigeria to strengthen the protection of human rights of older persons. Secondly, to highlight best practices, what Nigeria is currently doing that can be regarded as a good practice that can be exported and told to the global community or even the regional community. And thirdly, to also access if there are gaps in the efforts of Nigeria. It's no country that is perfect, it's, it's progressive and it's on a lighter note, henna, otherwise called lelli in Hausa, has been a long tradition in Nigeria that defies modernity, especially in northern part of the country. This age-long tradition, instead of disappearing, only experienced a paradigm shift from old method of application to a modern way. Bello Musa reports. Henna design is an all-cultural way women, especially in the north, used to decorate their skin. Some women in Kaduna say application of henna not only makes fashion statement, it is must for big wedding event. Henna is a kind of dye prepared from henna tree, application of which is also called kunshi in Hausa. Women, especially in northern Nigeria, decorate their skin with henna during ceremony like wedding, marriage, or during festivities like Salah. Though women love it so much that they apply it for leisure. Henna is a decoration that women used to do it to beautify their skin um, during occasion, like naming ceremony, wedding, sala, and any other activities. Some of them are doing it for their husband and some of them for their boyfriends. However, in the olden days, women apply henna without much design, but as time flies, modern henna comes in different design. We have different types of henna, mm -hmm. like we have uh, bridal henna, we have uh, casual, we have special casual. Bridal henna is for, bride, uh, is for brides. Casual is for those that wanted to do it on their own. Some, they want it black, some, they want it red. Some, some of them, come out, they like all black or red. Some women express why they like being decorated with henna. Well, actually, I love henna decoration because I love fashion and I'm a fashion designer. I do henna mostly during, I do it because it looks beautiful to beautify myself, to beautify my hands and my feet. There's a normal one they call lelly. That's a normal one they do it. That's what we used to do, our grandmothers used to do then. But now henna, it comes with designs. You see the designs. The first time I, I had it done on me, I loved it so much. I liked the way it looked. I liked the way, you know, when people, when you go around with people, when people see you, they admire you. How does a woman feel like when she applies henna? Well, I feel so excited feeling on top of the world, seeing the design on my skin. It's um, eye cutting. So whenever we do it and you see your hands, they look different, they look beautiful. You know, especially from the northern part of Nigeria, we like doing that. It makes us look beautiful, it makes us um, look unique, and it makes us uh, represent our culture. Price of henna varies depending on the design. It depends on how you want it. Maybe you want it to be large, that will cost a lot of money. Nowadays, celebrating wedding, naming ceremony or festival like Salah is incomplete without women applying henna on their hands or legs. 
In those days, women personally apply henna on their skin. But the introduction of modern design, many henna artists like Jamila Mahmood finds it a lucrative business. Bella Musa, Cross TV News Kaduna. Let me quickly take you back to a story I earlier highlighted. Residents of Sokoto are calling for urgent government's attention to tackle the menace of destitution plaguing the city. This has been compounded by the influx of internally displaced persons seeking food and shelter into the metropolis. Babengi Dabala reports that some residents are saying the situation is a threat to social order, not just in the capital city, but in the state. Sokoto State sit right in the front line of the war against banditry by the security forces. As one of the hardest hits among the four major affected states in Northwest by insecurity arising from banditry, kidnapping, cattle rustling, it has been battling other kind of social problems that have arisen as a result of conflicts. It has become commonplace to see major streets in Sokoto metropolis overtaken by IDPs who are mostly women, children, who are without an official designated camp begging for arms and food. But the lack of government's attention has become a worrisome problem for some members of the society. These children are future of Boko Haram and Sokoto will be worth it because it's only certain federation where there's no serious government intervention to tackle their problem. I heard them talking about uh, this issue of Majuri. That they've gotten grant from Malaysia or Indonesia. I'm calling on Sultan of Sokoto to use this foundation, Sultan Foundation, to tackle this problem because the government has failed. According to Sokoto State Emergency Management Agency, they have 18,000 IDPs in their weekly record. Uh, initially, the camp we used to have was allocated to the army, this Ed Garrison Command, along Arkila Road there. So, but now the government has given us another land where we are going to make an Azar camp at a Gagi area. So, but most of these IDPs, they do also have some uh, temporary camps within the town. So, most of our budget is go, goes towards providing relief for the IDPs. So, we do, and the government do it directly, to, um, is usually take it to them. And then we also bring in donors, NEMA and uh, other donor agencies. Okay. Yet, there has not been any arrangement by state government in form of camps put in place to manage the IDPs, a situation that forced people like Amamatu, a displaced person from eastern part of Sokoto State, to the south into Begin to feed her six children. <laughs> Bandit killed the father of my children after he left home to hustle for the ram to be used for the naming of our then unborn baby. He left me with six children. It was on Friday he left. We didn't see him again. They brought his clothes, telling me he was killed. This is my Duguru Road, also known as Gawon Nama, one of the most popular areas in Sokoto metropolis. Here you can hardly spend three minutes on the average minutes without encountering group of children. These children mostly of school age and below roam freely without their mothers or an adult inside for protection or guidance. Even for a state with a high number of out of school children, this new development is alarming. Yet when you ask police why is a particular place that is meant for the accommodation of the IDPs? What is the role of the government? What is the government spending every day in terms of their health care, in terms of their feeding, in terms of the education of their children? All these things are really not there. Even if you are a journalist, you want to interview, you want to investigate, you want to find out, they will see you as if you are in the opposition. And the governance, especially civilian governments, are not supposed to behave like this. Eastern Senatorial District has been worst hit by the boundary tree in the state. This area is made of Sabon Birni, Isa, Ilela, Gada, Guadabawa, Guarenyu, and Rabba local government areas. You're still watching News Hour on Trust Television. I'll see you on the other side of the break. Stay with us.
Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is news uh, on Trust Television. Moving on, Queen Elizabeth II's flag-draped coffin has arrived at the palace of Holy Holyrood House in Edinburgh following a six-hour journey from Balmoral Castle, where the United Kingdom's longest reigning monarch passed away on Thursday. Thousands of people lined up along the route in Scotland to pay their last respects to the late monarch, the only one most Britons have ever known. The coffin will be taken from Holy Road House to nearby St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh on Monday, where it will remain before being flown to London for a state funeral. It will then be moved from Buckingham Palace on Wednesday to the Houses of Parliament to lie in state until the funeral at Westminster Abbey on September 19th. Sunday's solemn drive through Scotland comes a day after the Queen's eldest son was formally proclaimed the new monarch. King Charles III at a pomp-filled ascension ceremony steeped in ancient tradition and political symbolism. King Charles III has been officially proclaimed head of state of both Australia and New Zealand at ceremonies in the nation's capitals. In New Zealand on Sunday, the proclamation of Charles as monarch took place in the parliament in Wellington. Speaking from Parliament Steps, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said the event acknowledged the King Charles III as New Zealand's sovereign, pointing out that in the wake of the Queen's death, New Zealand had entered a time of change. In Australia, Governor General David Hurley, the British monarch's representative in Australia, proclaimed King Charles as head of state at Parliament House in Canberra. The proclamation was marked by a 21 gun salute. The British monarch is the head of state in Australia as well as New Zealand among 14 realms outside the United Kingdom, a role that is largely ceremonial. Earlier, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said a national day of mourning for the Queen would take place on September 22nd, with the day to be a public holiday. Elsewhere, a 7.6 magnitude earthquake shook Papua New Guinea on Sunday, damaging buildings, triggering landslides and killing at least five people with several others severely injured. Residents in northern towns near the epicenter reported intense shaking mid-morning that cracked roads and rattled the cladding of buildings. Local member of parliament, Kessie Sawang, said at least two people had died in remote mountain villages, with four others airlifted to hospital in critical condition. There are limited communications in the area, few government resources and very few paved roads, making assessment and rescue efforts difficult. 
Small aviation companies and missionary groups were involved in airlifting some of the injured across the rugged jungle landscape. The quake was felt as far as the capital Port Mosby, about 300 miles away. The U.S. Geological Survey initially issued a tsunami warning for nearby coastal areas, but subsequently said a threat had passed. Russia has abandoned its main bastion in northeastern Ukraine in a sudden collapse of one of the war's principal front lines after Ukrainian forces made a rapid advance. The swift fall of Izum in Kharkiv province on Saturday was Moscow's worst defeat since its troops were forced back from the capital Kiev in March. This could prove a pivotal moment in the six-month-old war, with thousands of Russian soldiers abandoning ammunition, stockpiles and equipment as they fled. Russian forces used Izum as the logistics base for one of their main campaigns, a month-long assault from the north on the Addison Donbass region, comprising Donetsk and Luhansk. And in sports, Red Bull's Max Verstappen inflicted a home defeat on Charles Leblec and Ferrari in the Italian Grand Prix to continue his cruise to a second title. Verstappen beat Leclerc after the Italian team tried a questionable two-step strategy, surrendering the lead to the Dutchman twice on track. Verstappen's 11th win this year puts him 115 points clear of Leclerc and means he could potentially clinch the championship at the next race in Singapore. Mercedes George Russell took third place, ahead of the Ferrari of Carlos Sainz and Lewis Hamilton's Mercedes, both whom fought up from the back of the grid. Now, Ramco Evenepoel safely came through the final stage in Madrid to seal overall victory in the Vuelta Espana. The 22-year-old quick step alpha Vino Radia became the first Belgian to win a Grand Tour in 44 years. Colombia's Juan Sebastian Molano won a thrilling sprint finish in the 21st and final stage, a ceremonial 97-kilometer run into the Spanish capital. Tal Gjorgen Hart was the best-placed Briton in the general classification, finishing 19th. With sports, we wrap up news hour for tonight. Do not forget to follow us across all our social media platforms. I'm Zainab Bella. Thanks for your time and company.